Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of the Rosalind Franklin Society 2020 end of year virtual meeting. Thank you so much for joining us today at this session. I'm Juliana Lemire, science writer at Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News. We have a group of women joining us today who clearly have a lot in common, not the least of which is that they are all amazing scientists. But they also all happen to be award winners this year. So we've asked them to join us to dive into a conversation about awards and more specifically, awards for women in science. We'll ask the question, why don't women get them as much and why is that important? We're joined today by Alexis Comor, who's been an assistant professor at the University of California at San Diego since 2017. Before that, she did her postdoc in the lab of David Liu, where she developed based editing, a new approach to genome editing that has garnered a lot of excitement, particularly in conversations about the treatment of genetic diseases. This is largely due to the possibility it brings to correcting pathogenic genetic variants because of base editing's ability to edit a single nucleotide variant, something that CRISPR cannot do. Emily LaProust sits at the helm of one of the hottest companies in one of the hottest fields around. As the CEO at Twist Biosciences, she is leading a disruption through the process of synthesizing DNA on silicon chips. The field of synthetic biology is moving at breakneck speed, and Emily does not just keep up with it, she helps drive it. You cannot talk about the Human Cell Atlas, an effort to map every cell in the human body without mentioning the name Aviv Regev. Her research has helped to lay the groundwork for the field of single cell genomics. Aviv has been associated with the Broad Institute of MIT for almost her entire career, a position she left just last year to become the new head of Genentech Research and Early Development. Sylvia Ruskin, a principal investigator at the Whitehead Institute, has developed methods to predict and unravel the structure of individual RNA molecules in cells. She's interested in understanding gene expression regulation and physiology and disease through the lens of RNA. And Ruth Lehman has recently moved into a new role as the newly appointed director of the Whitehead Institute. She's returning to the MIT campus after a distinguished 23 year career at NYU. But she is no stranger to Cambridge as she had in 1996, left her faculty position at MIT, which she had held since 1988 to head to the city. It should be noted that during her first stint on the MIT campus, Ruth was part of the group of women at MIT who wrote the original report so simply named a study on the status of women faculty in science at MIT, which changed the course of women in science irrevocably. I just watched Picture a Scientist yesterday, so I'm going to add movie star to Ruth's bio. For those who don't know, Picture a Scientist is a movie made by Wonder Collaborative on sexism in science and has a large focus on the work that this group did at MIT to make systemic change for women on that campus and at other campuses as well. Sylvie Ruskin, a principal investigator at the Whitehead Institute, has developed methods to predict and unravel the structure of individual RNA molecules in cells. She is interested in understanding gene expression regulation in physiology and disease through the lens of RNA. So I'll start by asking each of you to fill us in a bit more on the prize or prizes you recently won, what they mean to you personally, and the role that you think this award or awards in general play in advancing scientists' careers. Ruth, why don't we start with you? I first should say that uh, I uh, I really play a very, very minor role in this movie. And really, uh, the credit for getting this all to work is is Nancy Hopkins. And I I probably the, the most um, important sentence to me that she says in this movie is 
we just want to be scientists. And I think that's just all what women scientists, they want to be just a scientist like everybody else. And I think we want to be recognized like everybody else. Um, and so, um, so I, I, I think that's, I, I just, she says things very, very clearly. And she was the motor of this movement, which then um, really took over. Uh, so, so I won, uh, I won the Vilcek Award this year. And um, this uh, award uh, recognizes immigrants uh, for their um, achievements in the sciences. Uh, this is an absolutely wonderful award and I am incredibly um, honored to have received this award. Uh, there, uh, I, um, this award um, is given by um, Jan and Marsha Wilczek. And they're a wonderful couple who moved to the States and they uh, worked at NYU. And um, they, um, uh, uh, Jan Wilczek uh, discovered uh, a, a, a therapy um, that is really helpful against um, a lot of inflammations. And um, he produced um, uh, um, pharmaceuticals that can be used um, and that were incredibly uh, helpful and made a lot of money. And he has invested this, um, these funds back into a lot of different, different, um, in, in different ways. And one is this prize. And actually the prize, his wife is an artist. And so there's always two prizes given each year, one to, one to a scientist and one to an artist of all kinds. So sometimes it's a poet, sometimes it's a, um, a actually culinary artists. Um, and then there's also prizes for um, up and coming um, uh, scientists. And Sylvia Ruskin uh, is, is, is one of the recipients. Um, yes, yeah, so it, it was a tremendous honor to win this award. And um, it, it meant a lot to me because it, for, for many, many reasons, um, it, it's hard to express all of those reasons, uh, but but when when he called me, so Jan Jan Vilcek is the uh, the the person who started the foundation, and he called me on my cell phone, and I was actually um, I was in the park uh, watching my daughter because it was COVID, and <laughs> she was playing by herself since you know no one else uh, can play at the time. But, but he called me to tell me that I won the award. I, I couldn't even hear it very well. And I just, I, I got so excited that, you know, something that I've done matters to other people. And um, as much as science is, 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 is a drive, an intrinsic drive and something that I love doing, there's, there's this tremendous extra excitement and, and pleasure knowing that someone else is appreciating it. And um, I actually like <laughs> teared up a little bit when, uh, when he told me, I just couldn't believe it. I was very, I was very excited. So it, it means a lot to me. Uh, and um, why I'm so excited about this award is because I am an immigrant <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, sometimes, and this is sort of interesting when we start talking about prizes again uh, later um, in general, um, I came to this country and you kind of, from I, I, I came um, as a young faculty member when I started my position at Whitehead. So I didn't have the normal, you know, mentors or anybody looking after me. And uh, uh, it is very different when you come from a different country and you appreciate, I appreciated enormously what the US had to offer, but I was always, I always felt very much like an outsider in a way. Um, and so um, this, this price is just uh, really has been you know, really wonderful for me. And, um, uh, and there's a wonderful group actually of immigrants. And of course, um, the way immigrants are treated in the US right now and the, problems we have with, um, you know, getting visas for people. Um, I'm just struggling with, uh, you know, visas for Chinese students. Uh, 
uh, it is so terrible. And so a voice like uh, with this price is actually really important. So this price actually carries more than the scientific recognition. It actually also really carries a really important message. And that is that you know, science has no boundaries and we should really be supporting um, you know, people wherever, the, wherever talent comes from and how important that is for the US and how important it was for the real checks, right? And um, uh, so, uh, so I think this is, uh, this is just a, a wonderful recognition. And so I'm, I'm really, and, and it's a great platform to talk about immigrants from, you know, given this, having given this prize. So, so it's um, uh, a little bit different from, you know, other, other types of prizes. Okay, thank you so much for that. Yeah, Emily, could you tell us a little bit about um, the prize that that you won and the significance to you? But uh, so um, I was very honored this year um, to win the Bio Rosalind Franklin Award, uh, which is uh, is is given to recognize a pioneering woman who has made significant contributions to the bio-based economy and biotech innovation, and. Uh, to me, it, it was a great honor. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a personal huge fan of Rosalind Franklin. Um, I did my PhD in, in DNA chemistry, and, and uh, uh, the first thing you learn is about the structure of DNA. And of course, she, she had such a pioneering uh, impact on DNA. But at the same time, she was not recognized at the time. Uh, and so I like the underdog uh, story. I, I associate with that uh, a lot. And, and the thing is that even though she's now recognized for viruses, at, uh, sorry, for DNA, at the time, uh, uh, she was uh, an expert in, in viruses. Uh, and she also was an expert in X-ray crystallography of coal. And so she had, she had had an impact uh, on actually many different fields. Uh, and so um, uh, it's, it's an honor to be associated with my very tiny contribution compared to, to what, what uh, she's done. And uh, and I think you know getting getting uh, an award is 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 fantastic. Uh, one I mean, definitely um, 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 kind of validates the the effort and persistence and grit that I put in to to get here. But also, it's it's a recognition to the the Fuller team. Uh, you know, at, at, at twist, I think that the the Rosalind Franklin Award was embodied by all the twisters. And you know, I am the, the visible figure, but uh, I stand on, on shoulders of, of giant. Um, and so I think it's, it's great to recognize personally, but also the, 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 the people that work at WIST and, and, and the people that help me uh, get, get there. And hopefully it will inspire uh, other scientists um, and, and women to get into science and, and, and you know, bring their best selves to work, their, their, their best passion, and, and just try to accomplish uh, some things. Okay, thank you so much. Alexis, um, I'm gonna ask you to go next. And um, if you could, I'm curious as to how, as someone who's, you know, in the first couple years of a, of a faculty position, you know, what, um, what impact w does winning an award at this point in your career potentially potentially have for you? Yeah, um, so so I, I was awarded a, a different Rosalind Franklin Award this year. Um, so the Rosalind Franklin Society in combination with the Genome Writers Guild um, developed a new award this year called the Rosalind Franklin Medal um, in honor of her 100th birthday. And that was awarded to an early career woman working in the field of nucleic acids research and genome editing. Uh, and actually right after that, I was very surprisingly, I was named as one of Fortune Magazine's 40 under 40. So that was a very awesome and welcome surprise as well as you know, a good year in terms of awards for me. Um, and, you know, it's really important as a junior faculty to have these things to go on your CV and to submit with your file when you're applying for promotions. Um, so definitely, you know, they're looking for that. A lot of my colleagues actually, when they heard, they said, 
oh, you need to put that, you know, talk about it in your self-assessment. And since you got an award, you should, you should apply for, for an acceleration. Um, and so, you know, you can get bumped up in these different steps that we have. And um, it's kind of notorious that men are constantly asking for accelerations all the time and, and women don't ask for them as much as men. And so, you know, having things like this award, which clearly means that, you know, someone in my field who is outside of the university thinks very highly of my work means a lot in terms of when they're assessing your file. Um, so that's really important. Um, obviously having an award with the name of Rosalind Franklin in it means a lot just because my PhD was in nucleic acids chemistry and I learned about Rosalind Franklin's contributions so long ago. Um, I've recently started in all of my, my manuscripts, whenever we say Watson Crick base pairing, we write Watson Crick Franklin base pairing. Um, I suggest you guys do it too, so we can make that be something in the field to, to honor her contributions. Um, the, the 40 under 40 thing actually was a, really a lot of fun because my non-scientific friends and my parents um, thought that was super cool. And, you know, you can go to this website on this real magazine and, and see that, you know, someone said that your contributions were awesome and you're, you're, you're a great scientist, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so that, was, that was really fun too. Um, and I just want to end with, with one little tidbit. Um, I, I did my PhD for Jackie Barton, who is very well known in the field of nucleic acid chemistry. She's, you know, at the time she was pretty much one of the only researchers who was doing research in um, bio-inorganic chemistry, which is what I wanted to pursue my PhD work in. And she received the National Medal of Science when I was in her lab. And she was getting, you know, all these people calling her, wanting interviews and whatever. And all of them said, oh, it's, there's so few women who have gotten this award. What is it like being one of the few women who, who got this award? And her response was always, well, you know, I hope in a few years, it's not notable that I'm a woman that won this award. I hope that, you know, we don't think about these things because women and men are contributed equally and they're, you know, they're thought of equally in terms of when we, when we give these awards out. And so I, I always think about that. And, you know, we're always moving forward and trying to push the frontiers of science. And at the same time, that's kind of one of these really big end goals in sight is when it's not notable, notable that, that you're a woman that won a particular award or did a particular thing. Absolutely. Aviv, over to you. Could you tell us a little bit about your award or awards? I think you're on mute, Aviv. I was just reflecting to myself on what Alexis just said about these lists. So maybe I'll start with that for a second before the awards themselves, that there's always these top X women in something. And I'm just waiting for the day where it's the top X in something without the woman qualifier. And it just so happens that they're all women. That, that would be, I think, the, the, the shift. The qualifier is always a little strange for us. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm very grateful because it was, a, it was a nice year of recognition. So I'll highlight a couple. I, I, I was awarded the FNIH Luria Prize in Biomedical Sciences, which is a prize that is made by the Foundation for the National Institute of Health, but was instituted by gift from Anne Luria, who's a famous uh, philanthropist and um, is, is targeted to people um, earlier in their career. They call us young scientists. I wish that was still uh, true to recognize, um, recognize contributions very broadly in biomedical sciences. So people of many different backgrounds and in, um, in areas have been awarded this uh, prize, which I believe started in 2012 or 2013. And um, I was also awarded the Keo Medical uh, Science Prize recently from Keo University, which is a long-standing prize always given to one um, uh, non-Japanese and one Japanese scientist, completely separately on different, on different areas. And um, the focus of, of this prize is on um, scientific achievement in fields of, medical, uh, of medicine and life sciences, especially in terms of their contribution um, to scientific discoveries that impact medicine, and also with the goal of expanding, you know, 
um, the well-being in society, networks between scientists, and so on. And in both of these cases, and actually a few additional prizes, um, these were all for the work that I've done in the area of uh, single cell genomics and its impact in, in biology and medicine. And the reasons that these were uh, very, uh, first of all, personally touching for me, my field is kind of an unusual field in biology. I'm a computational biologist by training. And historically, this has been seen, I think, sometimes by people more as an auxiliary area that, you know, it's in support of science, but it's sort of like not biology itself. And I think what has happened, especially in the area of single cell genomics, is that this is both an experimental and a conceptual field for biology, but a lot of the people who've done the early work come from computational biology, including those who have done a lot of the early experimental work. And I think it comes from a different perspective on how to do biological experiments and what we can learn from them. So even though the, these prizes are awarded to individuals, I actually hope that increasingly prizes in the biological sciences and more broadly would recognize the fact that biology is actually a team sport, that people do the work together, that when you do this work, it involves, um, first of all, the members of your lab, your graduate students and your postdocs and your uh, and other scientists in your lab, your collaborators from many other places, and as well as kind of this this relay race that happens in science where there's an idea and we do a piece of work and we share very openly the work that we do and other people pick it up and they do something great with it and they evolve that idea even further and then other people pick it up and it com comes back to you. That type of work is still not fully acknowledged by how prizes are, are made because of how prizes were established in a world that's actually quite different than some of the fields of, of today's science. Um, and so I see it as a recognition for our field and for the contributions in that field. And I'm very grateful for that um, in particular. I think in several of these cases, people and, and Juliana herself have mentioned the Human Cell Atlas. Human Cell Atlas is a large international um, collaborative initiative that I've had the great honor and, and pleasure to co-found, but it, I didn't found it alone. I founded it with a colleague, Sarah Teichman, who is a, a scientist at the uh, Wellcome Sanger Institute and a professor at the University of Cambridge in England. And in the Human Cell Atlas is one of those places where we can easily have you know, an opening session where every single speaker will be a woman. And we didn't actually do anything in particular in order to achieve that goal. We weren't actually paying attention or keeping tabs because for our community, that level of diversity and equity is now native. And we work very hard to expand it so that that diversity and equity will actually apply to many different uh, groups, not just um, in terms of uh, not just in terms of gender. And so I feel that these levels of recognition now kind of highlight some of the ways in which science is shifting, the style of collaborative research that we do, the interdisciplinary nature that requires expertise from many uh, different areas, experimental and computational, basic biology, medicine, and clinical work, and the uh, in the highly collaborative, open and interactive nature that um, science now has. And I think there's only more of that to come. Okay, terrific. Thanks so much. I am so glad that you ended on such a positive, hopeful note. I mean, that was terrific. Um, so, and couldn't agree with, more with you that things are shifting and we see incremental changes all over the place. And that's terrific. Um, talking about, although that said, um, it can't be disputed that, you know, women do not receive as many prizes as men. And when they do the, um, award, the monetary awards are smaller. Um, I was looking over a report recently where they had gathered a lot of data on these topics and they showed that a lot that women are more likely to be awarded prizes for, um, subjects that are not necessarily scientific research, but are about mentoring or teaching or service or other aspects of the career um, and not necessarily for research. So all of this being said, um, and, and I just wanna add one more tidbit, which is that I cannot have this conversation without, I, I have this image in my head um, of a photo that Virginia Lee showed at a talk last year, actually at the Rosalind Franklin Society meeting last year when she was speaking. And it was a photo from when she had been awarded um, the 2019 Breakthrough Prize. And the photo, she is on the stage, I'm not sure if you've seen it, 
And she is the only woman in a sea of tuxedos. She's just surrounded by men. And this is the 2019 Breakthrough Prize. Not This is not 10 years ago. This is not 20 years ago, right? So the question becomes, you know, how do we keep what you were saying, Aviv, there are changes being made. How do we keep these changes going? So my question then is, you know, what are the main things that you all think that um, science can do, either individual scientists or science as a whole, in order to keep that change going and to keep those um, to keep promoting women into, into places where they're winning awards. Um, Ruth, let's start with you again. I, I think um, somehow um, <laughs> it's funny. I mean, of course it's wonderful to win prizes, but I always have a really bad taste about prizes because I, I feel like, um, you know, just in the nature of them, they, uh, like Aviv said, first of all, they kind of highlight one person and usually your build. I mean, where you are, you know, it depends on your mentors and it depends on your lab and your environment. And so that it's kind of, um, it singles out people. Um, I was actually thinking, what are the best awards? And I thought, you know, poster prizes are great. Um, because first of all, um, you know, everyone who shows a poster is in principle could win the poster prize, right? Or whatever. You know, and so, so, so they're all putting in their nomination, and then they're compared. And um, because so prizes, you know, I, I, you know, it's it's so much who you know, um, where you trained, um, your network, and all these things which have actually relatively little to do with your qualifications. Um, and so, uh, you know, when we talk about diversity. Uh, it's uh, that is also um, I, um, you know that's an important point. I remember when I moved from um, from MIT. You know, I never thought I would get into the National Academy again, also because I'm a foreigner. Um, but um, you know, moving from MIT to a place which wasn't like full of National Academy members, um, basically, you know, that was like, yeah, you have now you lost your chance. The National Academy has changed this because now actually you cannot nominate institutional, you can't nominate anymore. And um, prizes are usually, you know, you, most of the prizes are nominated internally. I mean, it's either your mentor or it's in your institution. Um, it, most, you can't actually logistically not do self nominations because it's just too much for most of the places that give out prizes. Um, but, you know, there is no self-nomination mechanism, uh, which may also, you know, be difficult. Uh, so, so I don't know. I think um, as wonderful it is, you know, we all, you know, of course, you know, you should have had some people who should have won a prize and so often. So, for example, and maybe this isn't a bad idea to say this. So, uh, or it's, it's, it's really sad. I lost two of my, my very, very dearest friends, Angelica Amon, a month ago, and actually a week ago, Catherine Anderson. And Catherine Anderson is actually a very interesting person. Um, to me, she should have actually won two Nobel Prizes. Um, so she, did, she discovered the toll pathway, and the prize was given to a man who took all of her results and showed that it was um, it, 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 it played an imo important role in the innate immune system. But she, all the groundwork was done by her, um, and you know, based on genetic analysis she had done with Christiane and his life followed, but then she cloned the gene, she showed the similarities, she developed the entire signaling pathway, number one. Number two, um, she did forward genetic analysis in the mouse. Nobody would have done that. And she found um, that the hedgehog pathway had a lot to do with cilia, which completely opened the field that the cilia were actually involved in signaling. Nobody knew this totally, totally opening up completely new fields in, in terms of um, um, birth defects development. Um, so those are absolutely fundamental discoveries. She was a very quiet person. Um, I would say she was, you know, and, and so 
Um, and, and so I, I really feel like, I mean, she did get recognized and she got, you know, one of the women prizes, uh, I think the FASAP or, you know, some, some other prizes. She did, get, she, did get, she did get somewhat recognized, but if I think about it, I mean, I always remember that Nobel Prize and I had such a bad feeling where, you know, somebody who basically just skimmed off the top of what she had done, um, and, and so, so that's again where, I mean, a Nobel Prize is of course, you know, sort of the biggest one um, where this, this whole prize winning gives me a bad taste, I have to say, as, as wonderful and as wonderful it is, the recognition is obviously, you know, we, we feel incredibly um, um, uh, uh, gracious for, 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 for winning prizes, but it's, all, it's the exclusionary, ex exclusion and the, possibilities that uh, and I, I and that doesn't it's not about women I mean I I, I you know um, singling out then particular people um, again you know I think I come back to uh, <laughs> Nancy Hopkins all we want is just to be scientists and be recognized for what we do in a fair manner right uh, and that, I think that's a whole problem on the other hand you were talking about the breakthrough prize which now lifts prizes up to the Oscar status. And that is really important because, hey, you know, 50% of the US population don't believe in science, believe in science, right? So having scientists and, you know, it's unfortunate that, you know, if there are no women, but, you know, if there were more women, you know, just showing here are scientists and glamorize them, maybe that's a better way than when we talk, when I talk about, you know, how germ cells develop. Right, because uh, the, uh, this is not, you know, this is not going to be so exciting for for for, for uh, people, um, and they will not recognize it. And so, so, so these prizes, every time a big prize is published in a newspaper, it's going to be a big. Uh, it 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 helps science, right? So, so I, I I'm completely conflicted in my judgment of prizes. I I have a lot of thoughts on that. And, and I should say, um, it, it's really difficult for women in science because especially, you know, if you want to have a family. And I had uh, my daughter when I finished grad school. And, you know, uh, I, I noticed how a lot of my female friends who didn't continue in academia specifically because, you know, it was very difficult to uh, support a child and, and be a postdoc especially in many cities, in, in the big cities, uh, it's, 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 it's unaffordable, basically. And then you have to, I mean, even now with the COVID, you have to, you know, spend so much time and then, and then your career greatly suffers. And you just don't have that chance to compete. And actually I was, um, you know, I was extremely lucky because the Whitehead was very supportive when I, I moved here, I was just by myself, like a single parent with my daughter. And uh, they were very supportive. They, they helped me, you know, find daycare and nannies and, and all that. So I was extremely lucky, but a lot of women don't get that kind of support. And then if you don't have anyone to help you, uh, then it becomes impossible to compete in, in, in science because <laughs> there's a lot of other people who don't have those issues and they usually typically happen to be male <laughs> so, uh, and 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 so yeah it, it's it, it's very tough and it's because there is no good system set in place to support mothers I think young mothers and it's not even a young mother I mean it's in, in your 30s but that's considered a young mother now uh, <laughs> even though it's not that young but 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 that's what it, it makes a big difference and and for my classmates, um, I was, we were uh, 20 uh, people out of which 17 were female and only me and one other person remained in academia, even though all of us wanted to go to academia initially. And all of us tried in, in some stages and, and then slowly everybody gave up because of how difficult it is to have both a family and, uh, you know, highly competitive and, and you know, demanding uh, job in academia. And, uh, oh yeah, and then I should say what, like my solution was I, I did, I, I actually 
I was very excited about the Viljek Award because I'd actually taken some loans to get more nannies. I, I had at some point I had like five nannies and I didn't care that I'm spending so much money and I'm in debt at this point because because I knew that that's the only way I could make progress. I kind of I saw it as an investment in my career that you know I, I mean I'm spending this now so that I can afford to actually focus on work and and my daughter is going to be well taken care of. Um, and, and it really paid off because now, you know, uh, already I didn't expect it to pay off thoroughly. I, I thought, you know, at some point I would be able to pay it back and now I can't. But this is a risk that that some people, you know, are not are not comfortable taking. And, and they feel like, you know, I, I need to spend all the time to raise my child. And, and then you, you can't, it's very hard to do both. I mean, I, I think it's almost impossible. You need help, basically, is what it is. And help is expensive. And if you can't afford this expense, then uh, it's, it, you can't do it. And so I, I think there needs to be more, there needs to be more avenues for women specifically, young women, to find financial support. It's really important for um, their, their family. Does anybody else have something to add to that? Yeah. I, I might comment on, uh, I'll comment on the point of nominations. So years ago, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute to be an investigator, which I used to be, um, we, apparently it, it all depended on an internal nomination process. And then they took it away. And the reason that they moved to complete self-nomination was precisely this, that gatekeeping tends to reduce diversity. It affects women, it affects other groups that are underrepresented relative to what you would expect. And I, I, I appreciate that for many of the prizes, as, as Bruce said, that, that introduces a challenge. But the Breakthrough Prize is an example of a prize where it still requires a nomination, but the nomination is not given to the gatekeepers. So it's not at the institutional level. It is not that you need a special letter that you get as the dean or the chair to allow you to nominate. And I do think that these kinds of approaches, as well as prizes that don't limit themselves by the number of individuals up front, have more flexibility. And mostly it reflects a more modern modes of recognition because it's not that the older modes were necessarily wrong for the time when they were established. It's just that science was practiced actually differently a um, hundred years ago than it is necessarily today. And I do think that, I, I, I would imagine in some cases, I actually think that the groups and committees that come together, they grapple with this because it is, because it is a challenge. It, so, so one approach to this, of course, to say no recognition whatsoever. And I think that's why Ruth is so conflicted because you do want to see recognition for science and for the effort, but the fact that by recognizing one, you're somehow negating or, 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 or downgrading the rest is, I think, the thing that is so difficult for us in understanding how science is actually done. And it's not that I have a, a perfect answer for this, but coming up with creative additional approaches of recognition is important. And for women in other underrepresented groups in science, it is actually just as important to just identify the career signifiers and opportunities that actually make a difference. So to be an HGMI investigator has a real impact on your career. It's not just the recognition, it gives you the resources to do certain types of scientific work that might actually be very difficult to conduct otherwise. And those things later on feed many, many other successes. And I think we have to look at this holistic picture rather than just at the prize at the end, but at the path that leads to it and make sure that across, along this, this path, there's many opportunities for individuals to really be the best versions of themselves. Emily, would you like to say, add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting what you, you said that the, uh, the self-selection, the, the self-nomination is better than the internal nomination, and I, I, I totally agree. But but even that is is still imperfect because you know I see it in my in my work every day when when we uh, we, you know, we we send a request or we we post a, jo a job you know we we get a lot of um, people that that apply for a job and and men a lot of them is just garbage resume there is zero chance they could ever get it but 
they put their name in. And when you look at the woman's resume, they're all perfect. And 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 um, and so even that self selection is, is imperfect. And and sometimes we put jobs out, and we have a, someone in mind in the company to apply, and we have to go to that lady and say, you know, this job is for you. You need to apply. And and then often the person's like, oh yeah, I know, but I'm, there's ten things that you want. And and uh, and I only have nine. I don't have the last one, so I'm not quite ready. And so we have to, we have to to push people into the boiling oil, and and so it, um, so it's better, but it's not perfect. And I, I see it myself. I, I remember when my two co-founders came to talk to me about about Twist. Actually, it was their ideas, and and they came to me because they wanted me to be the CEO. And the whole time I'm thinking, oh my god, I, I really want to be the CEO of this company, but. I didn't even want. I didn't even ask. They, I, I was waiting for them to tell me that they and and uh, and I'm glad they did. But I, I was too, I guess, uh, insecure maybe that that I wasn't because I was a uh, I'd never been a CA before. That I, I even though I wanted it really bad, uh, I had to I had to um, uh, wait for them to tell me. And and then we went to pitch, and there was one investor. Um, I was pitching as a CEO and, and there was an investor that says, you know, we'll give you money if you change the CEO, we need a man with some gray hair. And and I was gonna do it. I went to my co-founder saying, you know, we should do it. We should change the CEO. And and my co-founder Twist Creek was like, I'll, I'll save you the expletive, but F this guy, we don't need his money. Um, and so, uh, so thankfully we also have a, we need to be ally to other women, and thankfully we have men that are also our ally. But uh, um, so we need to recognize that there is an implicit bias, and, and sometimes that implicit bias is internal. I know that that for me, uh, even today, we the company is a success, but I have this imposter syndrome um, of, of you know um, that somehow I didn't deserve it. Whereas I know I deserve it. I work really hard, and so the good news I think about prizes to me is that I'm glad to have it but what what makes me most hopeful is that the prize I got and the prize that you uh, ladies got will inspire someone else to be like you know what I'm gonna put my name in the hat I'm gonna go for it and, and if anything happens from that that prize that if it inspires someone to take a shot go for it uh, I think that 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 would have been worth it um uh, and I also got a super nice Rosalind Franklin bus, so I like that too. But but the inspiration of, about about two other women, I think I think that that's the real prize to me. You know, I will add something that occurred to me now. I think somebody made the comment, I forget whom, in in our panel about mentorship prizes that women get more of those than than maybe. I actually think mentorship is one of the good examples for something that is an individual prize. It's about your individual mentorship of someone or someone else's. And I got one of those this year. I, I won a, a prize from FACEB called FACEB um, 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 Excellence in uh, Science uh, Award. And I believe that it actually recognizes specifically your mentorship. And I'm extremely proud of that because that's one of those spaces where you're actually, where, when you, which recognizes the most important thing that we do as scientists, which is to mentor other people and teach them and make them way better than we are. And, and, and that's our legacy in the world also. That's where we really have the impact, not just the work that we do ourselves, the work that people that we mentor do. And I think some of the reason that we say, well, but that's not the, like the big league or, or something like that, as maybe has been implied here, is that often these are things that are associated with women like traits, whatever those might be and whether they actually exist, we shouldn't think that they're less. They're actually incredibly important. And they're one of the ways in which we, we do the best in science that we can. And so there's, these, there's so many underlying assumptions to how we value things and how we judge through them. And, and we need to, possibly all of us, <laughs> including us on the panel, need to kind of go beyond that, beyond that place. Yeah, I noticed something too when you mentioned you no know, women are given more of these prizes that aren't traditionally, you know, thought of as scientific. But that also kind of shows that um, 
it, it reflects how women take on this thing called invisible service. We're sort of overburdened with additional types of, of service just based on the fact that we're underrepresented. Um, and, and we don't usually get recognized for those things. Um, and so some of them are, you know, we take on additional mentoring um, jobs, like with women in STEM groups, you know, I'm a faculty mentor for ours, uh, for our women in chemistry group, lots of things like this um, that take up a lot of our time, but, you know, we're very happy to do them and we want to do them. We want to, um, you know, create a, a, the next generation of scientists. We, we want to train them. Um, but then we also think about overall women are underrepresented in STEM. So that's kind of why there are fewer women getting the like scientific prizes because there are fewer women to begin with. And that's an issue that in my opinion needs to be tackled at the source. I don't really ascribe to a lot of these people say, well, we need to, you know, look at the, the excellent women that are, you know, at the very, very top of their fields and give them more accolades. I think we need to tackle it at the source and get more women, you know, enrolled in, in STEM majors in college. We need to retain them better. That's a huge issue. We need to make sure that there are more women who get undergraduate degrees in STEM who then go on to do graduate school because there's a huge retainment issue there. Um, instead of just kind of picking all the people who, who did make it, all the women who did make it to the top and then kind of showering all these prizes on, on those ones, I think that you know it's systemic and, and there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done here. And one thing that my lab does is we participate in a lot of outreach with the local public high schools where they're socioeconomically disadvantaged and so they have really bad science equipment and we go in and you know we do some experiments with them and we try to get them excited and if that gets and it, you know if there's a couple of, of young girls in the class who see me and my female grad students and go oh I didn't know that was an, an option for me and we get them to enroll in a chemistry degree in college or something then you know I think that's really really important that's something that that we don't talk about enough and that people don't um, invest enough of their time doing. Okay, terrific. Um, I before now, um, oh, break one second, Jamie. Sorry. Um, we the email that went to everybody asked you to potentially think of one um, piece of advice for the new administration. So I'm just going to ask you that now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so before, I just want to end on one positive note, which is, of course, that the, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry did go to two women this year. And um, both of them, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, when um, they were answering reporters, I, their quotes were just, this is actually goes back to a, po a point earlier, a, an earlier point made in our panel about um, just being the kind of the forward facing, um, you know, face of science. And so Emmanuel Charpentier said, my wish is that this will provide a positive message to the young girls who would like to follow the path of science and to show them that women in science can also have an impact through the research that they're performing. And Jennifer Doudna said, I'm proud of my gender. I think it's great, especially for younger women to see this and to see that women's work can be recognized as much as men's. So ending on a positive note there from the, the Nobel this year. So before we sign off- You could also say it's kind of sad that they have to say that, right? Well, agreed. Um, so before we sign off, we just wanted to ask each of you if you had any wise words to the next administration, not specifically necessarily about awards, but about science and, uh, and women in science. Um, Alexis, why don't we start with you? That's, that's a, a loaded question, um, but I'm, I'm gonna keep it simple. There was an executive order signed by Trump recently that bans racial sensitivity training. Um, I you know, incorporate 
a lot of elements of, you know, teaching the next generation of scientists about implicit biases and how do we overcome these and, you know, how do we make our department a, a better place for people from underrepresented backgrounds. And because I am federally funded through the, the NIH, I could, you know, lose my funding technically if I, you know, continue teaching um, this and I, if I have, you know, I guess if it's, you know, mandatory racial sensitivity training is the exact words, but um, I think that that executive order has no business ever being even thought up and that needs to be, you know, X'd right away. Emily, how about yourself? Any advice? I know you asked for one, but I'll give you two for the price of one. Uh, I'll say, I guess the first one is, I would say put, put us in the game coach, you know, uh, make sure that you, that uh, the new administration puts, you know, top women in top jobs and uh, there should be easily uh, parity. And so I think that that, that should be the, the, the first, um, the first uh, advice and for every position, there is an outstanding, highly qualified uh, woman um, to, to take that job. And, and my second advice would be to invest in the bioeconomy. It's never too early to invest in the bioeconomy. It's going to be a, a, a massive job creator and not only a job creator on the coast of uh, the US, but throughout the continent. Uh, and uh, so that, that would be my second advice. Okay, thank you. Ruth, any advice for the administration? Really following up on, on, on Emily's comment, um, innovation comes from so many different sides and we don't know where it's going to come from. And uh, the US, and this was for me and we are, it's interesting, we have three of the four panel members are not born in this country. Um, when I came to the US, it was like, I can do anything. My ideas are expect. Uh, my ideas are accepted and taken seriously. And there was just something very amazingly freeing. And we we are at the verge of losing that. And if we lose that, we're losing our scientific um, our scientific chances of continuing to be uh, the leading nation in innovation. Uh, I think we have a real chance because the U.S. is still very attractive to foreigners because of that attitude, because of the welcoming attitude and this attitude, I don't care where you come from. If you have a good idea, we'll take it. And I think this kind of um, uh, acceptance of diversity and acceptance of ideas, that just has to come back as a message from that is what the US stands for. Okay, great, thanks. And Aviv? Um, to add on, on all the great points that were made, investment in science pays off, but you have to be patient to see, the, to see the outcome. And so if you stop now, you might not realize what happened until it's too late. That has to be an ongoing activity. And part of investing in, in science is making sure that it thrives. And it thrives on having the best minds, the best talent, the best opportunity and openness. And all of these things are global things. They're not limited to one country or one city or one state. And they require, for example, people who come from all over the world and talk to each other. So, which is a point that Ruth made as well. And the third point that I'll emphasize is education, which starts very early on and never stops. Meaning part of it is the formal education that children get in school, which is when thinking in ways that are more formal and quantitative get started. But it's also an ongoing thing. And there's no year like this year to remind us what happens when people don't understand that, when they kind of lose that part of the muscle of thinking like a scientist, even if you're not a practicing scientist or have never trained in science. That is critical for the well-being of all of society, and it's something that government has to reinvest into. Well, that brings us to the end of our discussion and concludes this session. I want to again thank Aviv, Ruth, Sylvie, 
Emily, and Alexis for joining us and for a terrific discussion. And I want to thank all of you for joining us as well. For everyone at Jen and the Rosalind Franklin Society, I'm Juliana Lemire. We start again tomorrow at one o'clock Eastern, and we look forward to seeing you then. Stay safe, and we'll see you again soon.